What's up, everybody? Hope you're all doing well out there in podcast land. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today's video is on Chelsea Football Club. Um, this weekend, they have just steamrolled Luton Town 3 0. Um, they've played well in their first three games this season. Um, they've picked up six points. But although they've got people talking, they haven't got people talking because they've played well in their first three matches. And they haven't got people talking because they're starting to play with an identity. Or because um, their squad depth is coming through. Or because they're starting to play in a system or there's a shape to them. Or the fact they're showing attacking intent. Or even the fact that some of their star players are starting to come good. Enzo Fernandez or Raheem Sterling. No, this isn't this isn't the reason. The reason why so many people are talking, so many people are having their say, is because of the amount of money that Chelsea have been spending. And a lot of that has been hogwash. It's been wrong. It's been uh inaccurate. And it's been unfair. Now, whether or not you like Chelsea, whether or not you're a fan of Chelsea, if you're gonna slag them off then it, you should at least do so um, accurately and fairly. And there's been a number of negative comments, thoughts and opinions on TV, radio, YouTube channels, even other managers like Jurgen Klopp. Uh, they're, uh, they're all having a go. And they're all taking pot shots at Chelsea spending and questioning the legitimacy of the spending. So... This video is going to highlight and explain how Chelsea have been able to do this, how they've stolen a march on everyone else, and how they do comply with FFP. So this video is going to explain how have Chelsea spent so much money. So here we go. The first point to make, or the first part of this explanation, is something that football fans don't really like. But you need to start looking at the football club as a business. Not as a community thing, not as a sporting thing. You've got to look at it as a business. And it's been just over a year since Todd Bowley took over Chelsea, since he, since he bought it from Roman Abramovich. And what he has done is he's looked at Chelsea with an American mindset. He's looked at Chelsea like a business, taken all the emotion uh, out of all of his dealings. And he's looking at cold, hard numbers. And what he's looking to do is build a team, build a squad capable of winning trophies. So his ambition is there. But he's doing it with a very business savvy uh, mindset. So first and foremost, what we need to explain about FFP is it's trying to level the playing field. It's trying to say to clubs, you can't just come in with rich owners and spend whatever you want, whenever you want which is sort of what Chelsea did when Abramovich first took over, you can only make a very limited loss over a one or three year period. If you go beyond that, you face fines, thousands of pounds, millions of pounds, whatever. You can face points deductions. You can face other sanctions. You could face being kicked out of competitions. Now, uh, a few years ago, Manchester City and PSG were investigated for FFP breaches. There was initial findings in the Manchester City case to have them thrown out of Europe altogether. Now, of course, look, we, this isn't a Manchester City video. We don't need to talk about that case right now. But this just shows what can happen if you breach either regular, you know, on a repeated basis or to a high degree of severity, FFP uh, rules. Now, Chelsea, as it stands, have not broken any FFP rules. So... The question is, how have they done it? Now, like we said a few moments ago, Todd Bowley has focused and zoned Chelsea in on being a business first. So we're not talking about football club now. Forget all of that. Just a business first. So what does that even mean? What does it even mean to say business first? The first thing it means is you have to treat everything in the business as an asset or as a liability. The product, the thing that is going to make it a viable business is football. So that means 
playing football, ideally with some form of attractive, attack-minded philosophy, whatever, and competing and winning major trophies. And then you can have bolt-ons. You can have your the club's in-house TV channel. You can do merchandise. You can do website sales. You can do social media. You can expand your revenue possibilities from that core base, your core product of being a football team, wanting fans around the world to support you. But beyond that, everything else is either an asset, which is something which can earn you money or make you money, or something which is a liability, which is something which is going to cost you money. They are the two camps, asset, liability. When you look at things in that cold black and white manner, you can start to move things around to uh, change ha the perception of how things are looking. So first and foremost, when you're a big company like Chelsea is, or any Premier League football club, every year you have to produce an issue and report something called a balance sheet. Now the balance sheet is a very formal financial document that lists or groups together all of your financial in incomings and outgoings. So as this is Chelsea, if we went to Stanford Bridge and we went to the Matthew Harding stand or we went to the Shed End and we wanted to buy a cup of coffee, let's say it costs five pounds. For every cup of coffee that we buy, five pounds, we can group that into the substance or confectionery grouping and each five pound transaction would be shown on our balance sheet under the revenue. We can group the revenue into uh, money that we get from ticket sales, money that we get from uh, replica shirts, money that we get from merchandise, money that we get from confectionery sales, so on and so forth. Every five pound cup of coffee will uh, add up to our revenue total. But of course that cup of coffee comes with a cost. The cost of the cup, the cost of the coffee beans, the cost of the sugar, the cost of the person per minute or per hour who makes the coffee. So that will go under our expenses column. So our balance sheet will show revenue, it'll show expenditure, it'll show assets that we have which potentially can earn us money, it'll show liability, like we just explained, things that will cost us money. If we owe money to other people, maybe we haven't paid a transfer fee yet, they will be shown as a creditor. So what we have is we have a pot which shows money that the company is making or expects to make and expenditure, money that's coming out of the company either now or in the near future. And then we can go into things like profit and loss. Out of that revenue, the income, how much of that will we actually make profit on and how much will we make a loss on and all that kind of thing. So the balance sheet is very, very important because anything within our business, whether it's a cup of coffee, whether it's a company car, whether it's a player, even footballs for the training pitch, everything will either cost the company money or make the company money. Now, once we get our head around that, we can start to group certain things into certain pots and then we can start using clever techniques as to how to manage those pots. So in the case of Financial Fair Play, FFP, when we take all of our revenue and all of our expenditure into account, we are allowed to make a loss, whether it's on a one-year period or a three-year period, but we're only allowed to make a certain amount of loss which from memory is something like 15 million pounds over a set period of time. The idea being that companies, clubs, need to be self-sufficient. They shouldn't really be run on debt and they should be living within their means. It's really trying to level that playing field. That's the idea behind it. Whether or not you believe in it, let's ignore it. The point is you're only allowed to make a certain amount of loss in a certain time frame. Okay, well, let's think about the expenditure side now. Probably the single biggest and well-known set of expenses will be players, when we need to buy players or give them new contracts. So that all goes into our expenses column. Now, I said before, how do we do clever things to manage those pots, those expenses pots? Well, what Chelsea have done is they've used a couple of clever accountancy tricks called amortization and depreciation. Basically, we can take something, an asset, something which is worth money, or we can take something which is a liability, which is going to cost us money, and we can apply clever uh, 
should we call it manipulations, perceptionary tricks to effectively change their value and apply that value over a set period of time. Let's take a real everyday example. Let's say we want to go and buy a car. Now, buying a car has two sets of initial costs that we can all relate to. The first cost is the upfront cost. We have to go and buy the car. Whether we do it with a loan, whether we do it with our own money, whether we just put a down payment or we buy it all in one go, there is an upfront cost. If we go and buy a £100,000 car, we can choose to pay £100,000 in one go or we, maybe we could take some sort of finance where we can split that. The point being, in any given financial year, there is an upfront cost. The second thing about the car is there is a running cost. So when we have a car, we need to have insurance. We need to get road tax. We need um, an MOT. We need fuel, whether it's an electric car or a fossil fuel car. You need to either charge it or fill it at a petrol station. You are going to basically burn money for the life of that car. There is a running cost to that car. If we keep that car for 10 years for argument's sake. And let's say in our example, it costs a thousand pounds a year to run that car. That's all the petrol, all the electricity, all of the MOT, the servicing, the insurance, everything, thousand pounds a year. So the initial cost of the car, if we exclude any finance, any interest that we have to pay is a hundred thousand pounds. And the running cost over 10 years is 10,000 pounds. So our car will cost us 110 grand, basically. Now, we can apply similar tactics here to football transfers. If we take the case of Raheem Sterling, he was bought uh, a year or so ago from Manchester City. And let's say he was bought for about 50 million pounds. So your initial upfront cost for Raheem Sterling is 50 million pounds. Now, that might be inflated somewhat because you might have to pay him a signing on fee you might have to pay his agent uh, a cut. So let's say it was 60 million for argument's sake. Your cost to buy Raheem Sterling is 60 million. Now this is where you can be cute because the way that you can pay Manchester City is instead of paying them 50 million up front, you might pay in installments. So you might pay 40 million in one go and then 20 million thereafter based on performance relations or add-ons or just stage that payment. Now, the important thing here is in terms of our balance sheet right here, right now, our expenses column, we only have to put down what we're going to pay in Manchester City. So in our example, we've just said 40 million. So although he's going to cost us 60, or depending on how it's structured, yes, performance related, this, that, the other, and add-ons, let's just say it's gonna be 60. What we put down right now is a 40 million pound liability, a 40 million pound expense. We can actually be cleverer here because if we think about the running cost of Raheem Sterling, let's say he, he signed a five year contract. So what we would, can actually do is split our 40 million pound expense, which we've agreed, or our 60 million pound expense, which we've agreed. And we can actually split that over that five year period, which means, from an accountancy perspective, instead of saying a 60 million pound player, we're only going to report that he's 12 million pounds. 12 million pounds this year, 12 million pounds next year, 12 million pounds the year after, so on and so forth. Five times 12 is 60. And what we've done is report a 12 million pound loss, not a 60 million pound loss. Now, the other element here is the running cost, like I spoke about before. So Raheem Sterling's running cost, excluding any player-related, performance-related bonuses, goals or assists or Ballon d'Or wins, is his weekly salary. Let's assume in this example, Raheem is earning five million a year. Now, in the example where he's on a five-year contract, that's 25 million pounds. If we add that on to the 60 million or whatever that transfer fee was, that's 85 million pounds. That's what Raheem Sterling is going to cost us. Now, in the terms of his salary, we can just use his salary, 5 million a year, as our reported expense. So if we go back to what we said at the start, 
this eighty five million pound player where we've agreed to pay sixty million in terms of his cost, and we've then agreed to pay uh five million a year as his running cost. Well, we've already split the upfront cost over five years, it's twelve million, and we've just broken his contract down over five years. It's five million. That's only seventeen million a year that we report Raheem Sterling's cost. So from a eighty-five million pound total liability, a total expense, we've only reported it as costing us seventeen million. Now going back to our car, there's another element that we haven't covered yet, and that is depreciation. Over the lifespan of that car, that that that, that ten year lifespan that we said we were going to have, the car's going to go down in value. The moment we drive off the forecourt, the moment we fill it up, the moment it goes through an MOT, the moment it needs a new set of tyres, anything like that is knocking pounds off the value of the car. So actually, the asset, which may have been worth a hundred grand at the start, and may have been worth a thousand pounds a year running cost, which is a hundred and ten thousand pounds total, isn't a hundred and ten thousand pounds total. Because the value, the core value of the product, which is the car, is going down year on year on year on year. The same can be said for the footballer Raheem Sterling. If we look at him in terms of a cold liability, a cold expenses standpoint, Raheem is going to get older. Raheem's output may change. Raheem's temperament may change. His commitment may change. So we can say over the lifespan of his contract, that Raheem's value, which we've said initially was 60 million to buy, actually goes down. At the end of that contract, if we wanted to sell him, he might only be worth 40 million. At that point, we could say, oh, there's a 20 million pound discrepancy there. We can factor that in to our balance sheet. So we can take the depreciation value over five years, which we said, let's say it was 20 million, which we can use based on market data now in the transfer market. And we can take a four million pound offset over his five year contract. So that 17 million pound cost that we said, which we take his salary and his expense together, is actually only 13 million pounds. Now we can also apply amortization to this. Now amortization works in a similar principle if we have an outstanding amount of money that we owe someone. So in the case of Raheem Sterling, we can say that we owe him money on two counts. And again, again we're going to ignore any performance related uh, bonuses over the term of his contract. If we said that we were going to pay 60 million to sign him, but we said in our example that we've agreed a stage payment where we pay 40 and then we have 20, and we've agreed that we're going to pay him 5 million a year, which is done on a weekly basis. We can amortize, which is effectively to calculate the deduction in his value over the money that is yet to be paid, and we can further offset that from his cost. So to put this in plain English, on day one, we've paid 40 million for Raheem Sterling, but we still owe 20 million on the raw cost. We've already taken into account that he's going to depreciate by 20 million. So what we can do is make a calculation, excluding any interest or any other costs, to subtract his depreciated value from the 20 million that we still owe, which will effectively give us a number which we can take away on the balance sheet from the 20 million. Now it's important to stress we're still going to pay that 20 million, but how we record it can be altered. The same is true with his contract. We've made a commitment we are legally obligated to pay him his weekly salary every week, for every month, for every year, for five years, which will equate to £25 million in our example. But of course, because he's depreciating in value because of age or whatever other factor that we throw in there, and we've calculated through market the transfer market data what that's going to be, we can take that off the amount we haven't yet paid. So at the end of year one, we still owe him 20 million of his contract and we can take that on the balance sheet as a calculated amount to deduct further so let's just go back to our, our example we know he's going to cost us 85 million and we know what we can do is say from that initial cost which was 60 
we can spread that over five years. So that was going to be 12 million as to how we report it. His salary, which is 25 million over five years, which we can report as 5 million a year. So that means he's going to cost us 17 million combined a year over five years. But we've said he might lose 20 million pound value, 60 million pounds today, maybe only worth 40 million pounds at the end of his contract. So that 20 million comes off, which is 4 million a year. So it's only going to cost us 13 million a year. That's quite easy to calculate. But we can also then take into account the amortization on that, which is based on what we haven't yet paid. And so what Chelsea will have done is worked that out again with market uh, transfer market research. And they probably are only going to report that Raheem Sterling is costing them somewhere in the region of not 13 million pounds, but it might be as low as 9 million pounds. So when you take all of those factors into account for somebody like Raheem Sterling, somebody like Enzo Fernandez, who cost 105 million, somebody like Moises Caicedo, who cost uh, could cost 115 million, depending on all the add-ons and what, what have you. Then when you take into account the real world, they're not doing my example, which is a five-year contract. They're signing everyone on eight-year contracts. So they are taking all of those transfer funds, the, the cost of buying the player. They are taking all of the contractual value spread over eight years. And they're spreading that expense. But what they're also doing is calculating what the depreciation, the likelihood depreciation of their assets is going to be, taking that off. And then they're calculating amortization on the money they haven't yet paid because the transfer fees are in stage payments and because not all of your salary is paid on day one. And they're taking that off the value of the asset as well. In the case of somebody like Mudrik, who was signed last January for something like £80 million, if you were to, if you were to say Mudrik, with everything thrown in, was worth £160 million over eight years, that's £20 million a year. But if you take off depreciation, if you take off amortization, he might only be costing them 10 million a year as how they report it on the balance sheet. When you do that for Mudrik, when you do that for uh, Cucurella, who they signed for 60 million, when you do that for Raheem Sterling, when you do that for Kai Havertz when he was there, when you do that for Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo, even Lavia, who they've just bought from Southampton you can see how they are offsetting those costs. All right, so that's that's something that we can calculate. We can calculate an upfront expense. We can calculate a contractual expense, the running cost. We can work out how much that's going to fall in value and offset that. And we can do some sort of algorithm to calculate what we can take off the money we haven't yet spent and take that off as well. But how do we actually make money? This is where Chelsea are also brilliant. Chelsea make money in two main ways. And we're going to ignore shirt sponsorship. We're going to ignore kit manufacturing revenue. We're going to ignore replica shirts and merchandise. We're going to ignore all of that. <clears throat> the two main areas that they make significant money are players that they've bought in and they sell. And they're homegrown players. So first and foremost... When Chelsea buy players, it's rare that those players then leave on a free. Usually what Chelsea will do is get the best out of them and sell them for the highest amount of residual value they can. So if you think of somebody like Romelu Lukaku, who they had as a young player, they sold to Manchester United, um, and they are in the process of trying to sell him again. If you think of somebody like Kai Havertz. He's a good example. Or Timo Werner. These are players that they signed for a lot of money and they still sold for a lot of money. Now, the way that they do that is because they are buying their players and spreading the cost as we've just explained. So if Kai Havertz was bought for 70 million and if his salary was 30 million, let's say it was 100 million total cost. The way that they are reporting that, irrespective of his con of his contract, is, as we've just said, year on year, taking depreciation, taking amortization into account. But when they sell Kai Havertz to Arsenal for 65 million, they're reporting that 65 million as a single 
revenue source. Forget about stage payments because the money is owed to them. It is a debt. So they are reporting that as revenue. The same is true when they sell somebody like Eden Hazard for 100 million. They bought him from France when he was a young, talented player. They calculated he might lose money, but in actual fact, he gained in value. So that is a, an extra wad that they can show on their balance sheet, extra profitability. And that happens with every player. <clears throat> in the case of somebody like Kepa, who's just joined Real Madrid on loan, they can take his his running cost, his salary, off the books entirely because Real Madrid are paying that. So they're making money through their transfer fees being reported as fat wads in one go, whereas the cost is being spread. And they can also just wipe off running costs if somebody goes on loan. So if Romelu Lukaku joins Roma on loan, as the rumours are, whatever he's being paid a week, they can just wipe off in terms of their expenses column. So again, the losses that they're making are now being squeezed because surpluses in revenue are coming in and the expenses are being taken off, just written off. The other way that they're able to do it is through their youth academy. Now, Chelsea have quite a strong youth academy. Uh, not all the players make the grade, but they will join teams in the lower leagues in England. They'll join teams across Europe. In the case of Mason Mount, they'll come, have a good start to their Chelsea career, and then join somebody like Manchester United for a big fat fee. Now, the way that you can offset your homegrown status <clears throat> to comply with rules is you completely write off any of the running costs to develop a young player. Now, of course, to find the talent, to pay for the scouts, to pay their expenses to go and scout the player, the time it takes to go negotiate with parents, get them on a on a on a youth contract, pay for their education and for their boarding and all the facilities. You know, the cost of a player could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds just to get one into the first team. But you can write all of that off under the FFP. So on the balance sheet, you can show that effectively as zero. So if you sell Mason Mount for fifty-five million pounds, that is all profit, not just revenue, all profit. The same is true of any young player, such as Hall, who's just joined Newcastle, uh, with an obligation to buy for £35 million. That's all profit. Now, Chelsea's academy is one of the best of producing players who will then be bought by other clubs. 500 grand here, 2 million there, 10 million here. It's a very profitable business model for them. And that is all at 100% profit. So they might be losing hundreds of millions of pounds because of the sheer volume of player that they've bought this year. But they're actually making a significant amount of money through their player sales. Player sales in terms of senior players like Kai Havertz and Timo Werner, and also through their younger players, somebody like Mason Mount or Hall. And what they're able to do on a balance sheet perspective is take all of that revenue in one big fat chunk with high profitability and offset to the max their expenditure so it looks like each player is costing them just a few million each year. And that is how, right now, they're able to comply with FFP. There is, however, a limit to this. They can't just keep doing this. What they're banking on, what they're betting on, is that they are going to qualify for the Champions League and get to latter stages of tournaments, which, of course, means more revenue. Because if they don't, there is only so far that they can offset that expense without that extra revenue coming in. There are only so many other players that they can sell to generate revenue. Havertz or Mount or players like that have gone. Timo Werner has gone. There are now limited other players that they can generate money from. So there will come a point where that expenditure, even how they report it year on year, just because of the sheer amount of it, such as Enzo, such as Lukaku, if they can't shift him because of his wages, such as Caicedo and others, will catch up with Chelsea. So they are banking over the next year or two, qualifying for the Champions League, getting to the latter stages of the FA Cup or Europa League or whatever it might be, and winning something. Because that, of course, with prize money and extra sponsorship and everything else that comes with it, is money that they can bring in on their balance sheet to offset that expenditure. So long term, this is not sustainable. But in the short term of a spike, that is how Chelsea are able to go under the radar. So the reason for explaining all of this is to show that 
there isn't anything technically wrong with what Chelsea are doing. Maybe a little bit of the stretching of the rules. But <clears throat> it's not fair to try and say that FFP only applies to some clubs and it doesn't apply to others. It's not fair for Jurgen Klopp to moan because Chelsea have decided to take a short-sighted view with a very, very high risk-reward strategy, whereas Liverpool are trying to be far more uh, self-sufficient and live within their means. Despite the fact that Liverpool turned out to actually have the money because of some additional player sales, but we'll, we'll ignore that little argument for a moment. It's not right for Manchester United fans who <coughs> we know how the Glazers run their club and the limited funds that they've got available and that Manchester United are trying to play within FFP. They're not prepared to make this sort of high risk reward strategy. So it's not fair to try and point the finger and say that FFP doesn't apply to Chelsea. Chelsea, um, thanks to partly because of what's happening with COVID, um, where clubs got an element of grace on that. But Chelsea have gone for a short term, high risk, high gamble sort of strategy, basically. And so it's only fair that it is called out for what it is. And that was the point of this video. So hopefully you understand a little bit more from a clever set of accountancy tricks, how they report income and how they report outgoing. That's how Chelsea are operating within FFP. I hope you found this video interesting and informative, and I hope it sheds some light on how Chelsea have been a little bit sneaky here, a little bit clever. If you, if you liked it, feel free to comment, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I'll see you all soon.